Hello, my name is Dan. Hope you're having a fantastic day. If you're new here, we talk about patient safety, quality, and risk in healthcare. If you're about that life, don't forget to like and share this video. Well, we're here today with Lauren Mooney. Uh, her contact information is below if you'd like to follow up with her. Uh, so welcome to De-Risking Healthcare, Lauren. How are you today? I am great. Thank you for having me. It's really a privilege to be here with you. We're going to talk about patient safety. And um, you wanted to start with a thank you, right? Yes. I want to say before we talk about patient safety, which can be is such a, a tricky problem. Thank you to everyone who's out there working so hard and for so many, many, many months and even years now. So um, we just want you to know that this is all done in the spirit of making things better, not just for patients, but for you as well. All right. So let's talk first about um, the fears of reporting events and how to grow an organization that is more fearless. Yes. That sounds like a good idea. Matter of fact, that's what led me to my most current focus, which is looking at that whole issue of are people, do people feel free to speak in an organization? And I, I got involved in higher liability organizing after looking at a lot of cases and just realizing, okay, I think that these strategies really help you when a lot is uncertain and you have this environment where you have um, a complex system, you have fallible people, you have fabulous people, people are actually fabulous, fallible and free willed. And we have to take that all into account as we look at how and why um, mistakes even happen. So the bottom line is we uh, have to be learning organizations. And the quote from managing the unexpected, which is just like the high reliability Bible that always uh, stuck with me was that you know, in, in an organization where people are, if people are afraid to speak out because of fear, um, the organization um, becomes unable to remain effective. It literally blocks effectiveness. So that really got me thinking, and that actually got me studying the whole speaking up behavior in healthcare. So there, there's multiple things going on. One, a worldview of somehow we're not going to have problems and mistakes, and it's this uncommon thing that we would report. Um, two, that, you know, the human nature, you want to protect yourself. It's, it, um, we have survival instincts for sure. And so not only do we not want to look dumb or wrong, we want to protect our job, our family, our reputation, um, and then just, um, blame at work, um, you know, shame and blame. And so we have to change our whole model of thinking to one where we accept that, what I call the humbling conclusions of high reliability is that, you know, um, we don't know everything, so we can't plan everything. And if you can't plan everything, you're going to have an imperfect system. It's going to have problems. We're fallible and we're going to fail. And we can't imagine all the ways that people and the system can fail. But we also haven't imagined all the ways that people and the system can create safety together. So the focus needs to move from you know, to err is human, which I say is half the story to, to create safety as human. And how do we, what conditions do we have to create in an organization um, so that we have people creating safety? And that means everything from reporting or acting in real time, improvising or whatever. So until we drive fear and grow trust in organizations and have people safe speaking about the issues as they unfold, you will never have patient safety. And that's why I actually now believe you can't fix patient safety. Patient safety is an outcome. You have to fix the way we work. The, the, the harm is a, is a result of the way we work. Patient safety will change when we change the way we work. And that's really the focus of that I, uh, that I have. What's uh, some, some things that people can do in pursuit of that, Lauren? Yeah, okay. So 
The first thing that I believe we have to do is get a good understanding of this world we work in and that it's very complex and there's more things that are uncertain and more unexpected events are going to occur than you could ever imagine. Now, if you, you're a risk management person, so you know when you go back through those cases, so many are like, oh, well, we expected that, but so many are things we would have never expected. When I looked at the cases, I saw things coming together in a way I'm like, oh, we just, we wouldn't have seen that coming. So once you understand that you're working in a lot of uncertainty, you realize you constantly have to be, make sense of what's going on and you need diverse perspectives. So what we have is this employee silence. We're not able to unlock those diverse perspectives and that, that creates risk. Now, the only people that can reduce the fear um, of speaking is a leader. So the first thing is going to have leaders educated to really value the power of diverse perspectives and really do kind of the inner work of saying, I have to learn to, to love bad news. I have to learn to be comfortable with that things aren't going okay. And then when and if, so when a leader asks for diverse perspectives, right? Everyone's watching to see what happens to that person that speaks. And in that moment, when that person gives the gift of their perspective, it has to be appreciated. It has to be followed up on, or everyone will say that was not appreciated. So it's scary. It's harmful or that they don't actually listen or do anything. So it's futile. So those two things, either it's unsafe or it won't work have to be overcome. And only the leader can prove it's going to be safe and it's going to be worthwhile. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So you're a leader in organization and you know some of your employees have fear, whether the mm -hmm. fears a fear of being stupid or uh, maybe uh, a fear of looking bad if they speak up, mm -hmm. maybe even um, uh, a fear that if they speak up about somebody else who's financially challenged at that that could really impact their life and they'd rather be quiet about it. As a leader, um, you probably realize and see these attributes, but you don't do anything about it. You may feel um, you have no power over it when actually there is power. And what, what could you say to our audience who might be in that situation? What tools are available to them to influence as a leader the reduction or elimination of these fears? Well, I think the human performance community, um, you read any of Todd Conklin's work and just the understanding that you have to have a culture where we under, um, understand that, you know, people are trying to do their best. We do have a, a, of course, every now and then there is someone who truly, for whatever reason, has, we can't help them. They're not, they're not willing to just have that, um, you know, there's something is wrong and, and there isn't a fit for the workplace, but, but most of folks, they, they're, these are blameless mistakes. And, and why are we still so afraid to mention them? Because we don't really believe that. So we have to really, for me, I'm saying we have imperfect systems, imperfect people and imperfect knowledge. We have to really move towards celebrating problem solving. We're still in, in, right? So it has to be, you brought to my attention that Sue is, doesn't seem right, thank you. How are we gonna support her? We have, in, unless the, the story that's being told, okay, there is a narrative. Did you hear what happened when? It has to be a, um, a restorative response with each and every time. People have an innate sense of what's fair and, if you are fair and you meet needs, everybody's going to know it and they're going to, they'll start to trust. But when you're not fair, um, they'll, they'll know and they won't trust. So trust is one of those tools, right? Mm -hmm. Would you elaborate? Yes. Yes. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to my business associate, um, Andy Barker here, who actually um, has spent many years building trust in organizations. And he, he, um, his message is very beautiful about meeting needs. And when we ask 
people to work in situations where they don't have their most, their basic needs met. Okay. I didn't get to eat. I didn't get to switch my shifts, which would be with my sick child. I um, didn't have the resources. You are naturally not going to trust your employer. So the very first step to build trust is go out there and say, what is it that you need that you don't have? And then make sure they get it. Um, and in that moment, the, you're going to realize, well, that, that person's here for my good. So that's, and then as you start meeting the needs of your employees, they will start to trust you and you'll get more truth out of them. Okay. Now you can start getting closer to what the real problems are, but you, people have to know that when I tell you the truth, you're going to take care of that. You're going to take care of it properly. So, um, it's really, it really is the people in power, how they handle meeting the most basic. Unfortunately for us, we're at the level of most basic needs because I always said, how can it be that we can transplant a heart, okay? Or we can do surgery on babies that haven't been born, but we can't figure out how to get you to launch. What's going on with that, okay? But that's how a hospital operates. So what's been, what's missing in this equation? And I'm seeing time and time again now these posts on the internet, the employees are going home exhausted without being supplied with what they need. I mean, I wouldn't trust either. So it's very, very simple. I mean, it's not simple, but it, you, you have to meet needs. What's another tool? Another tool. Another tool is going to be um, helping people grow appreciating that people have joined the organization for a purpose and that learning, they have a need to belong and to learn. And most people now actually, I'm going to put set healthcare aside um, because it has its own um, COVID extra burden, but people are leaving because they can't grow. Okay. Because they're no one's saying, well, wait, why did you show up? You spent years becoming a nurse. Um, and, um, what, what are your personal goals? So in our speaking in business, we, we focus on four things people need. And that is um, helpfulness, people feeling that their, their boss is there to help them, truthfulness, that I, I can tell the truth and the truth is being told to me, belonging, I fit in here and I see how my purpose fits with the bigger organizational purpose and learning is that I can grow here. And until you have a culture where those basic, you know, Maslow like needs are being met. Um, people will just be trying to survive at that lowest, lowest um, need. And they may, they may leave going to where they feel their needs are going to be met better. But I've talked to someone in LA and I recently who just left his job. And I said, you know, someone said, Oh, we'll be nice to, you need to be nice to the healthcare providers because um, you know, we're very busy and, um, get a vaccination. And the wife was crying. She had come home just dehydrated and crying. And, and so the focus was on the patients needed to be nicer. And my question is this, I said to him, I wonder what I want to know is when's the last time your, your leader was there saying to you, what do you need? And what ideas do you have to make this more livable? And he said, well, if you were in my organization, you would never have seen your leaders. And yeah. And well, he's just left uh, tomorrow, <laughs> but they didn't see their leaders the whole time. And, and he said to me, there's absolutely zero trust left in this poor little hospital. So very sad. So I think that's, I think acknowledging human nature, you said, what's the tool? The tool is going to be to real, to say five years ago, when I started talking about people, you don't understand they're, they're your greatest resource that where you look at them as this, this problem versus a solution. And I would talk about people and I'd be like, oh, is this sacrilege? Because I think we're only allowed to talk about systems and plans. And I said, but there's millions of people that get up every day to do this work. They've got to fit in. They, they must matter here somehow. And I think acknowledging the nature of human beings, they're not, I will tell you that in, in some of the real modern uh, safety worlds, they're almost to a point where like telling people to speak up and, and report near misses, we have to in healthcare. They almost gave up on it. They just said, forget it. Let's just show me the problem and let's fix it and hooray. Um, because you're asking them to expose, to, you know, uh, to do something that feels threatening. 
The tool of purpose is something we can think about in inspiring others, right? To find their purpose, to remember their purpose. Um, maybe we can sense that a loss of purpose can be restored and in doing so we get some benefits. What, what do you see the benefit of is getting someone in touch with their purpose again? Oh, I think it's huge. And I do think that the two layers working together are the strongest thing that an organization has. Um, individual purpose is, you know, that's what's getting that, that, that person out of bed in, in the morning. And um, uh, there was an article last night, how do I leave my job when it's a calling? Um, and so we've really put some people into some deep, deep conflict. When somebody can see how important their purpose, no matter what it is you do, and that's your job as a manager to show that individual, I need, it's very important that you deliver the right food to the right patient. Because unfortunately in the database, there's the person that ate before the surgery. Okay. And right. It's there. And that understanding the bigger purpose and then how you fit in is exactly, it's the strongest thing that an organization, um, as I said, can, can use. And if you can align your people around purpose, so we're not focusing on uh, problems, we're not focusing on personalities, we're focusing on what's the purpose here. That's really the intention. What do we want to be reliable at, at all those levels, reliable to the community, reliable for the different segments. And you get people focused on that and then start asking the key questions. I think people could get excited about work. Did we really just discuss learning or did, did we discuss purpose just now? Or I guess both. Mm -hmm. Purpose is huge. Um, let's, purpose let's focus on purpose. Okay. Next. Uh, well, my purpose in life I could share. And are you ready to Ooh. share yours? Yeah. Let's my hear purpose, yours. My purpose is to help others make excellent decisions. And I, I do that through the software that I, I lead my organization to create. I also volunteer my time um, and activities, uh, helping others to um, combine learning and leadership to make excellent decisions. Um, where the first part with software, we usually do it with data and culture. Uh, in the last part, it's um, you know really around the purpose of helping others other than yourself and giving you the tools to inspire and enroll people to do that. Oh. So that's what it means to me to help others make excellent decisions. Oh, that's awesome. That's a wonderful purpose. Well, thank wow. you. How about for you, Lauren? I'd like to hear. Oh, okay. So my purpose, you know, I really, um, I was working on some like sort of business plan strategy and I thought, you know, and I don't like to really separate. I just want to be me. Not, um, it's not like Lauren and her business. I'm just me. I try to just live it, you know, and I really want to do two things. I want to be the person that made high reliability organizing understandable and easy and fun for you so that you could be more, feel more competent in uncertainty um, instead of feeling like a victim of uncertainty. And then my purpose is to just challenge, lovingly challenge this whole notion that the model of telling people to speak up is going to get us where we need to go. Um, I feel it's, it's outdated, it's failing. Um, let's say it works about 50% of the time. I don't know, what would you guess, Dan? How much, if, if we looked at telling people to speak up as a process, um, and this is our process for getting upward communication, what percentage does it work? Hmm, I would guess um, anywhere from 50 to 60%, and then it drops to zero if trust is broken either locally in a department or higher trust is broken, it goes to zero. Exactly, mm -hmm. exact, right. Now let's think, of, I, I totally agree. I was, that's exact numbers I, I would say. Uh -huh. And that's what the literature supports. So before COVID, I, I was like, what happened was I was studying ambiguity. So this is a word we don't, I didn't really use the word much, ambiguity. It's got the word big in the middle of it, ambiguity, okay? so. 
Ambiguity means that things are unclear. Hospitals are ambiguity magnets. We have more things, just about everybody that walks in is, there's something that's unclear. So uncertainty is what you feel. That's the human response to ambiguity, okay? So we, we need to, um, what I wanna do is equip people to better work and live in uncertainty. Now, why? That's a crazy kind of goal purpose. But <laughs> I lived through so much of it. I had it in my work. Then I had it with a sick daughter for seven years and I, I, she's okay now. But during this horrible time, I got to see people, physicians mostly, their, how their response to uncertainty changed our course, made it miserable, made it better, got us closer, got us farther. And the power of being equipped in uncertainty and, and, and how, back to the, um, the ambiguity, you have the more diverse perspectives you can use and access and ambiguity, the better chance you're going to have. So we have all this unclear, so many unclear things, having people not willing to speak, I uh, had a moment of despair where I was looking at speaking up behavior among, I, I have the article over here and it said, nurses feel that it is unsafe and futile. And I said, if most professionals think it's unsafe and futile, that's our healthcare crisis because we can't learn. We're never gonna have safe patients until we fix this. And it is a big job, but I believe it can be done. So that's my purpose. And that's all, I'm a two trick pony, Dan. I'm like, I'm gonna make high reliability organizing easy. And I'm gonna uh, promote speaking in as a new model and then be a grandma. That's all I can do, Dan. <laughs> Do it well. Try. Well, thank you for helping me in my higher purpose, as I said, to help others make excellent decisions. You're to bring you on today and have you speak on this recording for everyone else. Um, I hope they all make better or excellent decisions uh, based on what they hear from you today. Thank so you. another tool. What's another tool? Learning is a tool, right? Mm -hmm. Continuous learning, not just learning once. So. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the world of patient safety, how can continuous learning be used as a tool for, you know, achieving that support that's needed of the individual or the leader? Let's start with the individual. Okay. Learning, continuous learning. Okay, so we actually, you know, our learning takes place, uh, Day to day, right? We're we we're living it. Um, learning. That's a, you got me a little bit stumped there. Um, the piece about learning that I I'm passionate about is the in the moment learning. Okay, not the I'm sitting in the course. So one of the things that I really believe in and is a big part of um, higher liability is something they call enactment. And I don't call it enactment. I call it um, acting to learn or actually poking the bump. And part of learning is going to be empowering people to probe uncertain situations in, in safe ways. Now we do this. One example for a nurse would be orthostatic um, blood pressures, right? We're not sure. All right, let, you know what? This is safe. Let, let's try this. And we're going to get gain information. Okay. Um, another way you could learn in real time is, you know, call a family member, you know, your mom, your mom is completely refusing food. Have you ever, you know, what matter of fact, um, a funny story with that is I had a head bleed after a horse accident and it's, it's a long sorted story of seven hospitalizations, but, um, I was in the ER and in the afternoon, my daughter was there and she said, you know, my mom's not talking. And that's a bad sign. <laughs> now they were, they were open enough. Okay. So they heard that and they said, you know, okay, so you learn squeeze with your right hand. Well, well, I couldn't. Okay. So right to the OR I went, but we have so much opportunity for learning right around us that we're not unlocking. Cause we, we just haven't been taught. Okay. How do you unlock what's so close, right? But not there. It's either behind a mouth or it's just one step away, but um, and I'll tell you, once you learn to do that, uh, poke the bump, as I say, um, and I did see that in cases, when you look back, 
there were the signs, right? Then, and usually what happened, we dismissed them. We said, well, it's probably just versus taking that learning in real time. What's that one next step I can do that will tell me more about what this is? So I'm passionate about that type of learning and it's really empowering for a person as they work. What would you say to a nurse who's maybe in an outpatient setting and realizes that some element of this is missing and that patient safety is clearly at risk or non-existent in the way we think of patient safety and culture. What would you recommend maybe the top three things that they could do um, to restore that? It's really tough when you're the person, when you're the average staff member, right? Um, that's exactly what you were talking about earlier. What's going to happen to my job, right? You rephrase that question. Okay. Do you think, well, okay. So it happened for NASA. Okay. So their failings are so public, right? You can't hide, you can't hide your errors. And they literally have, you know, a program. They're like, why do things keep going wrong? What are we doing wrong that's causing this? And they're, they're very authentically looking into this. Other, you know, other huge industries, especially, you know, definitely oil and gas. They've said, we, we're going to change the way we work across the board. We're going to change our culture because we can't have any more oil rigs blowing up. Do you think we're there or what will it take? Or do you see pockets? The end goal seems really clear and how to get there is very difficult, but it's completely, or I would say it's universally agreed upon that getting to that end goal is gonna be done in small increments. Lauren, I think we're in a space where the end goal seems really clear and how to get there is very difficult, but it's completely, or I would say it's universally agreed upon that getting to that end goal is gonna be done in small increments. And getting those small increments to happen inside our organizations more frequently is necessary to get there. You know, a faster rate of change rather than, you know, an organization looking at maybe 40 corrective actions or process improvements a year, or 40 corrective actions and process improvements a month. There has to be a recognition that some process improvements and corrective actions need to be retired and replaced with others. Kind of like, you can't have a checklist that's way too long or none of it's followed, right? Mm -hmm. And the best place for this change to happen is uh, at the department level, not at the CEO necessarily pressing down, not at the risk quality and patient safety departments necessarily um, pushing that through, not necessarily a process improvement team that's centralized, right? trying to use data in a way that they're always focused on the exceptions or, or other sources of data that can have a lot of noise in it, right? For example, if you're gonna be focused on, you know, your C. diff infection rate, um, what data are you gonna have there as you get closer and closer to zero to work with? So I think that the, a broad application of rapid correction, rapid selection and application of corrective action is, is necessary. And our risk and quality and safety leaders are in a great place to drive that. I also think there's a conflict that the financial parts of our organizations want to drive that. The government is talking to them directly. They're saying, if you can you know, reduce this number, we'll give you more money because we think it's important for you to reduce that money. And then you look at, you know, 20, 30, 40 different things that might get you a little bit more money. And then you start to pick the ones that are the most obtainable. And then you go to your clinical organization and say, we want to obtain these, we'll, we'll get another $100,000. That the clinical organization 
needs to stay in a process of using broad improvements mm -hmm. rather than financially focused improvements, right? To, to get the most amount of financial improvement. They need to be able to, um, they need to be able, uh, my friends in HFMA say it's really hard to talk to the financial people about clinical improvement because they're, they're two different mm -hmm. worlds. So if we allow the clinical folks, maybe we can arm them with the vocabulary and some kind of proof to go back to the financial organization and say, look, if you give me this extra person, if we can fund doing these initiatives that are about our staff, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than buying a gadget to get to higher patient safety, mm -hmm. can we meet the needs better to get these tools we were just talking about, trust, right? Connection to purpose, um, learning, um, overcoming fear. Do we, do we give what's needed to our clinical departments to then raise the level of quality, work towards zero patient harm, rather than trying to aim at four particular quality indicators that were closest to achieving. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying about um, the unit level. I mean, it's the front, only the front line knows what it's gonna take in that particular department, right? They know that they, they, yeah. these other folks, they, they care and they may measure, but only that person in the front line. And that's one of the things that I truly believe is that an organization needs to heal from the inside out. And that means you can't come from the outside and prescribe these things. You have to unlock the knowledge and the energy within each person in the system because they know, they actually know. And the other thing is uh, that this is, you know, depending on where you are in the safety world, it might sound um, a little far out there, but if, you know, the, the safety two folks would say, oh, my cat just entered. Um, stop focusing on everything that's going wrong and focus on what needs to go, what must go right. Okay. So actually um, I was talking to someone from one, the head of safety from one gas. And he said, you know, what we identified is five things that need to be present. So we stopped saying, don't have this happen. Don't, 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 don't. And say, do, do these. Cool. If you, and, what and are those five and, things? Oh, I don't know yet. I have to, <laughs> but okay. you know, I thought, so I was actually at, a resilience engineering conference at the Mayo. And we were talking about, you know, how do we incorporate, uh, you know, what must go right? This, is, this, you know, for your audience, this might be very interesting. So what must go right when you're taking care of a patient? And I said, you know, I can give you an example. And I said, from watching, from reading all those cases, instead of saying, don't let this happen and don't let that happen. I would say what to a young nurse, what must go right is that you have to have oxygen, to all the tissues all the time. Now, you're at risk in a zillion different ways, depending on zillion too big a world, not word, not that many. You're at risk in different ways of your patient losing oxygen to some of all of their tissues. What are they? And how are you going to make sure that goes right? And then you can individualize, okay, we have to make sure we meet your need for oxygen. But in the case, in the cases when you read them, you see it was slipping away slowly, they were septic. There was a clot that was unrecognized. You know what I'm saying? But we all in the end die because of a lack of oxygen, right? So being in tune with that number one thing, let's, before anything else, let's make sure we're getting oxygen to our patient. <laughs> Doesn't always happen, does it, Dan? So, you know, I think a, a mindset shift to let's get to the front line. Let's, let's allow them to solve this, this is another thing. What org, I believe what organizations don't have is the permission to solve their problems. We group doctors, do they really have the permission to solve their problems? They would never choose to work the way they're working. But are they allowed to, do they really have the freedom to say, well, we, we, could, we could solve this, but we'd have to do it that way. And then there's so much control, right? Um, that they can't make those changes. Hey, thanks for listening. If you want more, be sure to click like or subscribe. If you like to appear on our program, be sure to fill out the SurveyMonkey below. Most important though, 
If you know someone who should hear this video, please forward it to them so that together we can all work to make healthcare just a little bit less risky.